these series consist of uh, five consecutive panel discussions followed by Q and A by our um, students. Uh, in in each of these panels, we've been trying to intersect um, different frameworks of knowledge, science, and technology, and its linkage to impact on society broadly speaking. So yeah, today's is our last and fifth, and um, entitled on the human machine embodiment of knowledge. Uh, we have tried to use some frameworks uh, and critical theories like queer theory, radical feminist theory, um, black analysis, but of course, you know, uh, I have a feeling that today's panel will also touch on able-bodied logics and uh, a bunch of other frameworks that we could sort of uh, use to analyze, you know, what it means to embody knowledge, either as a human or as a machine or as an object. Um, so with that, I'd like to welcome both of our panelists. Uh, we have Wesley Gates, who has graciously agreed to participate uh, on behalf of Sanchita Sharma. Uh, Wesley uh, holds an MFA from Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University. She's an artist, uh, an academic, and a PhD student in the Department of World Arts and Culture, FACD at UCLA. Um, her research focuses on trans embodiment in the public spaces of U US urban centers, investigating both everyday movement and artistic performances to eliminate the world-making capacities of trans transgender bodies. She's been published in Partake, the Journal of Performance as Research, Gulf Coast Journal, and Media N, Journal of the New Media Caucus for Coming. And her performance work has been seen in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Boston, and Prague. Wesley is currently training as an amateur boxer with Transbox in LA. I want to hear more about that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Veronica, Veronica Santos is a professor of mechanical and aerospace engineering and an affiliate faculty of bioengineering as well, and also a director of the UCLA uh, Biomechatronics Lab. She currently serves as the associate dean of DEI and faculty at First Florida School of Engineering. Uh, Veronica earned her bachelor's in mechanical engineering uh, with a minor in music from UC Berkeley. Uh, she was a quality and R&D engineer at Guidance Corporation and earned her master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from, from Cornell. As a postdoc at uh, USC, she contributed to the development of bio-inspired tactile sensor for prosthetic hands before moving to Arizona State University as an assistant professor. Her research includes uh, hand biomechanics, human machine systems, tactile sensing and perception, and prosthetic robotics for grasp and manipulation. Veronica was selected for an NSF Career Award, uh, the U.S. Defense Science Study Group, a U.S. National Academy of Engineering Frontiers of Engineering Education Symposium, and numerous teaching awards. Her work has appeared in TechCrunch and Forbes, among others. With that, welcome both. Thank Sorry, you I thought much. you were going to excerpt what you wanted from that. I would have cut <laughs> I wanted everybody to know how amazing and busy you are. <laughs> I also wanted to briefly acknowledge our students who have been really great at engaging in each of the panels. Uh, we have two main roles in, in, the, in the group. Uh, we have a Titi here alone today, <laughs> taking care of our recording or webinar. Thank you. And then uh, we have our development team here. So it, it throws him with we just taking notes and transcribing what is said uh, today and coming up with um, sort of a version of, of, of that. Um, and, you know, while this in-person participation is limited due to the field like structure. We are, sort of, uh, we will be sharing potentially this webinar along with our audiences. So with that, I, you know, we can get a little bit started. I wanted both of you to speak a little bit about your research before we start sort of merging uh, fields together. Maybe uh, Veronica, we can start with you. You know, uh, the work in robotics is prosthetics as prosthetics, as systems that assist humans. Could you tell us more about you know, what it is that you do? Yeah, so our biomechatronics lab, um, our mission is to improve quality of life for uh, individuals uh, through human machine systems and in particular through robotic grasping. Um, roughly speaking, we study human, robotic, and prosthetic hands and how to give robots a sense of touch. And we think of human machine systems as lying on this continuum where on one extreme, you can have a robot that is intimately connected to the body, like an upper limb neuroprosthesis. On the other extreme, you can have robots that are remotely teleoperated for maybe demining 
uh, types of tasks. And in between, you just have you know the robot getting farther and farther away from the human. Maybe it's a a, a robot that's mounted to a wheelchair for activities of daily living, a little farther away, but still in the workspace for collaborative manufacturing. And then you start getting further and further away to applications where you don't want to send humans because of how dangerous it is. Thank you. And Wesley, how would you describe your own work as well as a performance artist and sort of you know, the occupation space of in transfer? Um, yeah, so my training is in theater. I used to be an actor and I became a director. Um, and now I'm getting a PhD because you can't make a living as a freelance artist. Neither as a PhD. Oh, well, I mean, yeah, <laughs> but we're in our fingers. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, so I became interested in looking at performances that take place in public space, um, whether that's theater, dance, um, new media work, um, and thinking about the ways that performance can sort of propose different modes of existing than, than the everyday. Uh, so if, if a space is, normally has one use, like how can performance activate that space uh, in a way that sort of brings other possibilities into being? Um, and thinking about that, especially as a, as a kind of like tactic by uh, minoritized populations, communities like the trans community, queer community, for instance, um, to, uh, yeah, to sort of like reclaim spaces in which we might not be uh, be welcomed or be seen as like properly occupying that space. So, I mean, unfortunately, I feel like my work is only getting more topical because of all the legislation that is sweeping the US that seems to be uh, looking for ways to kind of like legislate trans people out of existence by like saying like, you can't get your medical care where we are not going to talk about you in school. Um, so basically kind of like trying to sort of disappear um, trans bodies. So I'm trying to think through like how do these performances and other like more everyday acts of like taking up public space uh, sort of make a claim for a trans existence to say like, yes, we are here, we belong here. <laughs> and we're like, and by doing that, like making space for other trans people. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, both of the summaries. So maybe to start carving into space, right, and how we occupy it, or machines can occupy it, or machines can serve to occupy the space on our behalf. Um, Veronica, I wanted you to guide us on what are the design parameters. Let's forget a little bit about the the, the you know specific sort of politics mm -hmm. or um, you know what the the ro robots or the machines might serve. If you were to think about um, how a machine might occupy space to serve a specific, specific function, how do you go about the design process? How would you conceive specific machine or its functionalities? Yeah, I would say that the, the first thing that we think about and many engineers think about is the application. Who's going to, who are the operators? Who is the robot going to interact with? Is this going to be a robot that's poured on off in a manufacturing space and it can go as fast as it wants and do potentially dangerous things? Or is this a robot that's going to be in the home, possibly used by individuals with disabilities? I mean, that's, you think about the form, but also the function and who it's going to interact with. Um, but it is, you know, a very utilitarian way of thinking about things. So I'm kind of excited that uh, roboticists are beginning to think more about social connection and um, expression through robots, which we can get into a little bit later. But it is very utilitarian. It's, it's what is the functional task and um, that kind of dictate, dictates size, power requirements, um, form factors, the, type, the dexterity, mm -hmm. those types of things. Could you give us some examples of what you consider the you know, the bread and butters of robotics in terms of what people- The components? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically you have actuators, sensors, and I'll define these in a second, but actuators, sensors, and then some uh, computation. So the actuators would be, um, you think of a motor, and there's a wide variety of motor designs, but the typical motor is like a DC motor that's electrically driven and it has a spinning um, axle. Then you have sensors, and these can be, um, you know, human-like or not human-like, but the typical sensors you might think of are vision, like the, the 
cameras on your cell phone or tactile sensors, which um, is what all our lab thinks about all the time. What is it? What does it feel like to touch things and how do you convey that to a remote operator or how do you um, enable a robot to do something with that information? And then um, there's the computation where you are drawing inferences from your sensors and then deciding how to act with your motors. So there's a, a typical sense, think, act mm -hmm. like a triad that robotics takes. Okay, yeah, that's really useful. Man. I think it helps me pivot a little bit towards Wesley's work. I'm thinking about sensors, right? We perceive uh, something like color of movement, right? Uh, specific body posture, perhaps, right? We leave this camera as we do a gesture that I want to do, will like, you know, look at me and zoom in. I think that's so. Um, th th this poses a question as to what is it that you'd be looking for, right? What do we want to sense for what purpose? And I think in these utilitarian uh, sort of examples, right? It might be specific sort of uh, you know, body elongation, and not elongation, but a, a functionality and extended functionality for somebody with disabilities, for example. But Wesley, I'm assuming you spend a lot of time thinking in a performance space, which is a relatively delineated space, how we can either highlight or hinder specific aspects of a body of a human mm -hmm. that may not be so much based on functionality, but a specific message or performance or artistic expression. And I feel like here, what we might consider the sensor and performance might be a bit different, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, there's a couple of, I don't know, listening to, to you speak, Veronica, I was thinking about like, yeah, that like the different inputs that you can get uh, as a performer, but also just like, I don't know, as a human walking down the street, like how do I like accumulate this sort of like sensory information that make, that give me you know that sort of answer questions like do I feel safe here? Um, are there you know uh, am I like around other people like me? Am I not? Is that like is that sort of like pushing me in a useful way? Is that sort of shutting me down? Um, and that can be you know that can be visual, but it can also be. Um, it's like not exactly tactile, but it's a, it's a, like it's a feeling, right? It's a kind of like sensory um, mode. So I mean, I think about that, and then yeah, in performance, um, yeah. I mean, I guess I think about like as a director, I would think about um, how to. Let me turn it back up from that. Uh, as a performer, like there's data coming from, uh, like, from the audience. Like, I guess that's that's like another important thing mm -hmm. is like the audience as a source of input. And so, like, my as a performer, like I'm often sort of sensorially attuned to um, the presence of the audience and how like that might change. Like, I'm probably going to perform differently. Uh, in rehearsal when I'm, you know, just when there's nobody watching versus like, what does it do to have eyes on you that like produces a different kind of um, of response, like of action. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was a really yeah. open ended question. I think there's lots to think about, right? Um, even, you know, in, in terms of lighting or, you know, also technical aspects of, of sort of, you know, uh, stage design that, mm -hmm. that could be incorporated here, right? Yeah. But I like that you mentioned safety because I think that probably there is a lot of common language between um, different disciplines about what safety means, but I'm not sure there is one in this case mm -hmm. uh, because I would assume, and, and this is really a question that for you, Veronica, considering safety with machines and robotics pertains to some sort of definition of the well being, the physical well being of a buddy, right? Where perhaps for you, Wesley, it's a bit more nuanced than it can be framed as safety in terms of, you know, um, uh, trans logic or gender logics, right? And so when we think about Veronica, maybe perhaps, I mean, and these are assumptions, so please push back, right? But do you feel like uh, these kinds of, uh, you know, particularly for machines that are designed for that closer to the human body, mm -hmm. um, the gendered notions are sort of incorporated in what's considered safety. Gendered notions or safety in general? 
gender specific? Gender, yeah. Notions that have to do with not just, am I gonna, is this robot gonna poke my uh -huh. eyeball out? But do, does it represent, is it built in ways that represent somehow my gender identity? Or does it move in ways that feels like it's natural to me and not somebody else? Yeah, I think, okay, a couple, couple ways to think about it from the gender lens, which is that historically, most robots have male names and only more recently are um, institutions and, and labs begin to think about female names. Um, for example, NASA calling their, their robot Valkyrie. That was a conscious choice. Um, of course, there are non-binary alternatives and I don't think anyone in, in robotics is really thinking about that yet. As far as form, I know that if you just start shopping for robots online, you have the, the bulky, you know, not aesthetically pleasing types of robots meant for industry use, but the ones that are intended for healthcare or being in the home, being mounted on a wheelchair, they now all of a sudden have these like really, really beautiful curves and, and things that are a little harder to manufacture, but might be a little more appealing and less intimidating mm -hmm. for um, a human who's gonna be in very close contact or interacting physically with that robot. Um, but there's also, I think, just the behavior of the robots in terms of movement. It's a very different choice of movement when you are trying to do something utilitarian, like, you know, imagine you're on a manufacturing line and you have parts and you're supposed to pick them out and it's just as fast as you can go. It's very what people would typically think of as robots on the, on the line versus robots that you want to have a personality or to interact with people where robots would move a lot more slowly. And um, what's interesting is like, I was thinking about, you know, for dance, if you ask someone to dance like a robot, they make very rigid and sharp movements. Mm -hmm. But then on the flip side, roboticists are, are constantly trying to make their robots more smooth and fluid. Like the human likes it's like you know, wanting the opposite thing. But I think the smoothness of the movement, um, the predictability of the movement is something that that is deemed safer. Can I, can I respond to that? Yeah, I, that's interesting. I mean, what you're saying about the design and the sort of like the way that robots for different purposes are, have these sort of like different design features, like it also makes me think about how labor is gendered, right? So the robots that are doing these sort of like industrial, like I'm going to pack, I'm going to lift stuff, like don't need to be pretty, which is like also kind of like a way that you know, I don't know, like culturally, it's like, okay, men, like whatever, it's like blue color, like, look, but these like, but the robots that are maybe doing more care work, which is like a feminized mm -hmm. kind of labor, right? Like also then have to like be appealing, mm -hmm. <laughs> like in, in the way that also often like women and femmes are like, expected to mm -hmm. sort of like be physically appealing whilst providing services. <laughs> Someone's like the devil, but that, that added standard for you know female environment, whether it's robots or human, has to be pervasive, right? And there's yeah. a, a common um, concept in robotics called the uncanny valley, where if you try too hard to be human-like and you just don't get it right, and we are so good at, at detecting things that you know maybe are not asymmetric or smooth, um, then you know it, it's okay if the robot is like. R2D2 or C3PO. We have no problem with that. And then as soon as you try and get closer and closer to human like um, features, a, a classic example would be um, the animated conductor in the Polar Express. Mm -hmm. People thought that that was creepy because they tried too hard. It wasn't exactly right. And so you've now like fallen into that. I see. Thing. How do you call that that way? Uncanny. Okay. It is true. Yeah. I guess. So, what are the reasons for it? What do you think the, the reasons are for it? us reacting as a society a little bit. I think we've just grown up and been socialized to kind of put things in bins as normal and not normal. And there are certain characteristics that fall under normal and things that are not normal are, are automatically um, deemed scary um, unless you have someone with an open mind who's going to think more about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes me think too about some like some research that I'm doing right now on, on perception and sort of how we interface with with the world and how we like move through the world experientially and 
Uh, there is a like philosophical subfield that I'm looking at right now called phenomenology, which is like trying to think about, um, yeah, like consciousness and experience and like the internal, like what's the relationship of, of my body to, to all of you and to the things in this room. Um, and one of the things that uh, some <clears throat> of those philosophers talk about is the way that we sort of like background certain things like we can't sort of like hyper focus on everything as we move through the world and sort of your body like it kind of like picks out your con or your consciousness picks out like what do I need to know or what do I need to understand um and so I wonder if part of it too is like it's like when I, it's like I see like humans like okay human like somewhere stored in my mind is like how a human registers for me and uh, and how I relate to them. And so I sort of like don't sort of like, it doesn't interrupt my mm -hmm. flow <laughs> as like, of existence, but like when you come up against something that it's like, wait, that is, that's not like, it kind of, it interrupts that sort of like seamless ability to just sort of live your life and experience it. Like it pulls you up short mm -hmm. and it's like, wait, what is this? Like my brain doesn't, my experience doesn't know how to like correlate that. So it, it causes that kind of like through. It's so interesting that you got into phenomenology because um, I started collaboration uh, with some researchers at Cape Western Reserve University, and they introduced me to researchers at, at Sigma State and their experts in phenomenology. Oh, cool. So I was trying so hard to keep up with their language. So I started listening to audiobooks <laughs> of phenomenology, which is um, hard to listen to. But it's, yeah. it's all about the consciousness and how you perceive the world. I think one of the classic examples is, you know, what is it like to be a bat? Well, no one will ever know. Like I'll never know what it's like to be you or you. It's um, we perceive the world in our in our own way, and it's it's kind of like um, I think the phrase was a like a sustained hallucination. <laughs> yeah. Well, another yeah another thing that I that I am interested in about it, which I think is like totally apropos of your work, is like the way that. Um, like prosthetics or like objects that we're holding can become extensions of the body. Like if I'm holding a pen, okay, if I like, I'm gonna tap my hand with my finger, right? I don't really have to think about it. It's like, I sort of have a sense experience of like where it's gonna end up. If I do it with a pen, you can kind of do it without thinking about it, right? You don't have to sort of measure like, okay, how long is this pen? Like, like I look at the pen, I make, I sort of internalize it and I can just, and it becomes almost like an extension of, my body and I feel like that's is it, um, is that true like is, that, is, is do you think about yeah, that, um, like robotic extensions there is a phrase for that um oh, I'm, I'm blanking but there is actually a phrase for the, the extended proprioception or something like that where um you know using a tool is like that and one of the things that I think researchers some researchers would really like to achieve is um based on a concept that came out of Japan in 1980, which is called tele-existence. And it's basically a remote operator, some, some human logging into a robot forever around the world and embodying that robot. And the typical way of thinking about it, the traditional utilitarian way is um, robot teleoperation. And it's about using a robot as a tool. But I think the dream is to use the robot as um, not a tool, but as your own body. Mm -hmm. You are, you just log in. We've, we've done these experiments, um, as have others, but we've had researchers from Cleveland log into our robots at just one floor down from here and interact with students in my lab. We actually had two grad students shake hands for the first time through the robot. Yeah, cool. And because <laughs> our robot had tactile sensors and, and their operator had a haptic display glove, they actually felt in. The visual tactile synchrony of a handshake or you know, doing tasks together. Um, so I think there's there's a lot of really, I mean, what we would love to do is, is study embodiment in that way, but I think it's a little bit controversial the types of experiments that you can do in that way and the inferences you can draw. Because depending on the the participants that you recruit, some of them are more susceptible to, um, I don't want to use the word illusion, but it's kind of like that. Some people are more susceptible to, to falling into that sense of embodiment, whereas others are not. This is very interesting. I want to tap into a few of the things that you all just mentioned, which has to do with embodiment, right, um, of a robot, as well as 
the um, you know we're at, I have a feeling that we're tapping into um, you know the the creepiness of like getting close enough to a human leg but not enough so that cognition trigger right that comes mm -hmm. up in phenomenology and maybe we can flip the narrative around and ask a question you know perhaps too much of an optimistic or positive thinker and and saying could robots um, I kind of want to walk back to just one type of embodiment with it which is agenda embodiment but I would say it really applies to anything that we consider not normal uh, you know I move in ways that I've learned from my mother and the environment around me the older I get the more I realize it just mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we we just copying each other in the ways we move right and so we perpetuate patterns right of ways of being this is one example of you know gender identity and some of us can play with that sometimes but generally I think people go about it in, in pretty unconscious ways and so I feel like, you know, that coupled with uh, identity politics and how things are in today's world can provide a narrow set of options for people to behave and be in acceptable ways. So the question I'm trying to probe is, is could robots one day, you know, untethered from these cultural biases and could move in ways that could give us opportunities to embody new identities, new forms of way, you know, Something that I'm not learning from my uh, other, you know, close humans, but but could robots move in ways that give me an example and freedom for embodying something that feels somehow by pure luck more my own identity or more into it myself? There's actually a term I want to get right, um, which is uh, there's a new subfield of robotics called choreo robotics, and so um, choreo roboticists believe that. I'm quoting from the internet, that incorporating dancerly gestures into machine behaviors will make robots seem less like industrial contrivances and instead more alive, more empathetic, and more attentive. This was from a, a wire.com story. But but uh, they have videos of you know a bunch of robot arms and they're acting like a herd of animals. And the, the cool thing about robots is that you might have one physical embodiment, but with the Press of a button, you switch the control algorithm, you can make it act in a completely different way. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine a whole spectrum of, of gendered types of movements that you could do with one or more robots. And if seeing that that behavioral switch in real time, that, that could be one way to open people's minds to their own perceptions based on movement, because mm -hmm. the the machine itself, the physical machine and the appearance has not changed at all. Mm -hmm. the behavior. Mm -hmm. As I'm thinking that it could be a, a, a robot that can, you know, mimic the three of us in exchange of you know, mm -hmm. and kind of highlight the, the construction of much of our own identity, right? Mm -hmm. It's alarming. <laughs> I mean, I'll tell you that I watched the movie last night and it was uh, Top Gun Maverick and uh, there actually is some machine learning that went into the, the recreation of someone's voice oh, wow. in that movie, which um, I won't spoil it, but when you watch it, you can you can Google this. So there's already the ability, if you have enough data to, you know, of course, deep fakes have a negative connotation, but you could actually recreate the tone, the timing, the pacing of someone's voice, and you could do that with movement as well. Uh, so many directions that I, <laughs> I want to take this, um, yeah, right. but I guess like one thing I would ask is, is um, I would be curious to hear more about learning and like and how robots learn because I feel like I have a like reasonable grasp on like machine learning and like algorithms, but how that gets applied to the physical movement because like when I, um, like when you're talking about you know I move like my mother, it's like how do we how do we learn those sorts of behaviors is, you know, by, you know, being in proximity with people and growing up with them and watching them and like having physical contact. And um, there's all kinds of ways that uh, embodiment, like, and gendered embodiment becomes like itself through sort of through repetition or through like observation and like learning. So like, yeah, so I'm curious how that, um, how does that, happen like can the robot yeah. like learn new forms of movement or I'm going to burst your bubble a little bit <laughs> in that um 
learning in robotics is not like the way that we all learn for the multi sensory, the years of, of development and understanding, you know, the consequences of our own movements with respect to the world and others. Learning in robotics is tuning parameters until mm -hmm. you get a policy that um, achieves some task because typically it would be a utilitarian approach. And the, the art behind it is the engineer crafting what's called a reward function to say, okay, I want the robot to be able to do this and here are the metrics you're going to use to quantify if the performance is good enough or not here are the things you can do with your body now try some stuff and the robot will you know you might be able to seed you know start the robot with specific classes of movements maybe um, informed by how humans do things or maybe you just let the robot flail and figure things out um, which some some research have done and over time when the robot is learning it's it's really tuning parameters so that it maximizes the reward of it. Hmm. So I feel like we have a long way to go. Yeah. If we're ever, I don't even know if we're ever going to get to um, biological quality of learning, sure. but the way that learning is done, reinforcement learning, if that's called, if that's called in robotics, um, is very mathematical and about optimization and following gradients and tuning parameters mm -hmm. until you get the optimum. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, but it's also like, I don't know, it's kind of wild to also then to think about that in the other the other direction. Like, I don't know, I'll just like get super real with you. <laughs> but like, so I'm transitioning right now actively and like one of the things that I think is so amazing about being trans and about like trans embodiment is like, you're just like, oh my God, like I'm 30 whatever years old and my body can like suddenly, it's like my body can like do this stuff, like it can change. Mm -hmm. And there's almost a way in which I feel like, like hormones are almost that like oh, yeah. protocol <laughs> shift <laughs> where it's like the hormones are like telling your body, like actually do this other thing. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then the body's like, sure, I can do, I can do that. Like, so there's yeah I don't you know not to like it's obviously not one to one but I think there's a way in which I I I, I am almost like feeding my body a new set of protocols mm -hmm. it's like learn how to do this other thing like learn how to like yeah yeah it's, I mean you make me think of like the word plasticity mm -hmm. with the neuroscience yes. I I used to from my mechanical engineering training I always thought of plastic as like kind of rigid. But from the neuroscience perspective, plasticity is this ability to rewire and, and relearn. Um, you know, I guess the plasticity of biology. Yeah. Yeah, totally. No, I love that word. I'm glad you brought that up. And just, yeah, because I think like bodies, uh, yeah, bodies are totally plastic. Mm -hmm. Like, and even, you know, sometimes there's this distinction that gets drawn between like the biological and the cultural or the biological mm -hmm. and the social. It's like, actually we're plastic in mm -hmm. all of it. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and even for individuals who are not transitioning, just think about what you ingest yeah. right? and the effect of what you eat on your body or if you change your workout regime, how much your body can change physically. So, um, for sure. yeah. Wonderful. Well, that's a great insight. I'd like to talk more about them. Since we already have an hour in, I'd like to sort of open the book for questions. We can have, we can have a discussion. Thanks. Um, okay, this is like, um, I'm just really curious, but like a lot of times there's like always this idea that like, oh, robots are gonna take over the world. But like more specifically, like an argument that my brother and dad have recently is like, my dad will like be like, oh my God, I feel so sorry for this inanimate thing. Or like, did I make this AI upset or something? And my brother will be like, no, like it's just an algorithm and you can't think. But I was wondering, like, especially for robots that like are meant to like move like humans or do things like humans, like how do you like think about them and not like put like human emotion into them? Or like, should you? I was... Yeah, you're you're making me think two, two different things. The first thing is for, for a long time, okay, what's funny is, we will name the computers in our lab, but I have not named any of our robots. And part of it is because it, it 
for me personally, it like puts too much on the robot. I will immediately gender it and think of it as as uh, you know an independent agent, which I don't think it is. Um, and the, the second thing um, is that oh, I wanted to mention this, this experiment that I think you find interesting, which is there is a, a paper that showed a robot that was designed to be like a guide in a museum. And it was just kind of let roam free and people could go up to it and interact with it. And um, what the researchers found is that children would go up and bully the robot. And maybe they were trying to be mean, but they were curious. You know, they, they realized that if they all formed a circle around the robot and held hands, the robot could not move <laughs> because it was programmed not to run into anyone and not to injure them. Mm -hmm. And I think the kids just kind of figured out figured that out and then started playing to see what can we make this robot do. And when you read about that, you kind of feel bad for the robot, even though you know it's it's you know it's a thing with wheels that is programmed to move or not move based on whether there's something in the way. Um, so I think it's hard not to ascribe personalities and uh, feelings to agents that may not look human-like, but act human-like. That's just natural. I mean, we do the same thing with pets and things like that. Although those are those are biological. Should we see Megan? Not <laughs> like yet. Megan. Megan. <laughs> you have to. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. I just like yeah, it's like so out there. Is that like yeah, the robot like if it doesn't have feelings now, like yeah. it's going to like we're headed in that direction. <laughs> Because I think Veronica brings a good point, you know, at least I think about, right? I don't want to take it to a dark place, but you know, there are ways in which, unfortunately today, there are many ways in which we have a hierarchy of personhood. We've spoken about this in prior panels, right? And I think perhaps there might be a point in the not so distant future where certain humanoid sort of robots are part of that ladder, right? Um, and with the distinction between us brushing off saying, well, it doesn't have emotions, so whatever, gets blurred, right? And it starts intersecting with those people that we continue to oppress and curtail mm -hmm. one way or another. So I think robots might be a good way to, for us to question where is our limit in, in, in humanity and understanding that they're all their lived experiences, right? I don't want to call out a specific country, but there is a country where a humanoid robot has citizenship. And in that country, actual biological women are not allowed to drive. Just, you know, if you think about the hierarchy, mm -hmm. that, that seems kind of wild to me. Exactly. And I think, I mean, well, I, well, I had one ask more questions, but actually, I went a little bit. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Megan, for asking the question. Any other questions? Well, I guess kind of on the other side of that, do you think that like humans are also like, responsible for collecting robots? Because like we've kind of given examples and then like also like on Twitter, I know they released like an AI and like that was meant to like mirror behavior and like within a couple hours it was like racist <laughs> and <laughs> all of the things we try to avoid. Um or at least I feel like everyone here tries to avoid. Right? Or like I know there was a robot in Canada, I think that was meant to like come all the way down like, the North America or something. Right? Mm -hmm. But then um as soon as it like reached the United States, it was like murdered. Canadians <laughs> <laughs> yeah, were very helpful to the robot. I think they were like it was like hitchhiking, it was like people, but it got to like Boston or something, and it was like over. Um, <laughs> there's there's a phrase sometimes that students are reminded of when things don't go their way in the lab, and it's like, well, the robot did exactly what you told it to do, and you told it to do something wrong. But that because robots do what we program them to do, and and humans aren't great at turning something that we do naturally into if then statements, there's always going to be, um, I guess, corner cases that are not pre programmed. But those, those negative behaviors are all coming from the human engineers. I don't think we have robots programming robots. Just yet.
course. I, mean, I really like what you just said about robots programming robots because I remember hearing about back when everyone was really into like Queen's Gambit, like yeah. in like chess. I remember like there were two different like those like supercomputers, like there's two different ways that computers play chess, and one was where every time it would play a real person and it would like kind of shift how it played based on that but one was it just continued playing itself and was developed and so like I guess it's I'm just like asking about like do you think one way is better than the other or like for a robot to learn from like itself or from another robot because it was like a completely different like style of play I think I don't know if one's better than the other I think it's a matter of what what data the robot is using to learn from and that's been done for chess and Go, which I think was deemed a even bigger feat. Also, Atari games and things like that. Again, they're learning policies, but whether one policy is better than another, I think. So, like when when you start getting into those sort of like recursive, like it's learning from itself or it's learning from other AIs, does it get it? This is like getting into the thing where it's like a human starts to be able to not understand it at all in some yes. of these cases right because it just sort of like dives so far down one of the main criticisms of machine learning is that right. it's this gigantic black box and if you put garbage in you'll get garbage out but you give it a lot of data it does some things and and tunes billions of parameters and and can overfit your data but it gives you a model data that you gave it it may not be able to use that model perfectly on novel new data that it's never seen before it might be close, but that's why when it comes to, to machine learning and pattern recognition, um, you know, for use by law enforcement or um, even, you know, measuring your pulse using uh, images of your, your finger pad and looking at blood flow um, and even getting soap from an auto automated soap dispenser, it, it depends on the data that the algorithm is trained on. If it doesn't recognize um, certain faces or certain skin colors, it's going to categorize them quickly. Is it, is it that different for humans when they exist in their own bubble and they're fed specific news or, um, you know, film, television, whatever? Is it, I mean, maybe, maybe it's much more complex. That's a great analogy. <laughs> we probably only know what we've experienced or or gone out and tried to learn about it. Any questions? Hi, um, I have a question with something towards direction. So um, I I've been part of like previous like musical productions like big bands and a lot of them are story based. Mm -hmm. So it was like century theme, like maybe like one year was like I guess this year's like into like the show the program I used to use that are focusing on like feminism, right? Mm -hmm. And they have a story they want to tell. But I've noticed that unless it's that um, unless you're inside the group and really being a part of that process of making it, you as a watcher, you don't get that same experience. Mm -hmm. So it's probably coming from a director's standpoint of understanding like what you see and what you want to convey may not translate well to the audience. Like how do you navigate that and how do you navigate this? Like yeah, that's a great question. Um yeah, it's hard, right? Like you have to kind of compartmentalize or like my experience was like I would have to sort of compartmentalize and at a certain point like I would almost have to like, yeah, like be two people. <laughs> like I was like, there's the part of me that's like deep in it with the actors and the designers and my other collaborators. And it's really like speaking the language and, you know, and then at a certain point, especially like as we get closer towards, you know, opening night or, you know, when you, you share it with other people, like then it would have to sort of step back and try to forget <laughs> everything that I, you know, not only, uh like learn but was facilitating right and then would have to sort of be like okay how can i do my best to sort of approach this um with fresh eyes like is it from a neutral perspective um and not you know not sort of hold any assumptions or whatever and there's a lot i mean i i'm literally just thinking of this now because i'm in the room with 
various scientists of different kinds, but I like, I wonder if it's almost a sort of like, I don't know, is, is it like, is it like testing a hypothesis or something when you have to sort of like, be like, okay, I think this, but now I have to sort of step back and be objective and bracket and not sort of like assume results, <laughs> but actually try to like look at it and see like, okay, what's actually happening on stage? Like what is actually being communicated rather than just assuming like, well, this is what I want it to say. So that's what it's saying. But to sort of like test and be like, okay, actually, actually though, what is it saying? And um, yeah, to bring it like, I mean, I don't believe in objectivity, but like to bring more objective or like, yeah, just fresh. Does that answer the question or help at all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are maybe some training models, perhaps I don't know to speak more to this, but I think there are ways in which you can not just simply take an optimized for a given result, but sort of iterate from sort of partial erasure mm. of sort of a priori knowledge, right? And, and sort of allow, you know, some of them are called generic algorithms and so on, you know, but allow things to run a little widely to see where they go, right? Yeah. And add enough sort of so-called entropy or chaos to the system that you might be able to, with enough time, <laughs> iterate in enough time, gather as many sort of viewpoints from the audience, for mm -hmm. example, right? To try to make sure, am I, am I conveying the message that I intend to yeah. convey? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes me, yeah, that makes me think too about, um, yeah, I mean, different people have different styles of like how, um, how repeatable or like how controllable do you want the performance to be? Like, do you want the performance to be exactly the same every night, no matter who's in the audience and no matter, um, you know, or like, are yeah, are you going for like repeatability and sort of like consistency or are you going for a kind of like responsiveness or liveness where maybe are there, are there elements of the performance that are more like where the actors have more sort of ability to um, like respond to what's actually happening in the room? Like who's in the audience? I think of like, I don't, know, I don't do Shakespeare at all, but I think of like, there's a figure, uh, there's a like type of Shakespearean character called the clown. A lot of Shakespeare like comedies or even tragedy, some of them like have the clown. And a, the thing that a lot of like contemporary performance, uh, like productions of Shakespeare will do is like the clown kind of has like the license to riff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're sticking to the script, but like the clown is like gonna like walk into the audience and make fun of somebody's clothes or like has the ability to sort of like step out of mm -hmm the sort of the rigid context of the play and kind of like break the rules a little bit and have that live interaction. So yeah, there's like different. When would a director want consistency, repeal, repeatability, and no riffing? Just to stay on time? <laughs> Why? Um, I don't know. I mean, some people are control freaks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's a very tempting job for control freaks. <laughs> um, no, but I, I guess also like if they're, you know, they're because meaning is so sensitive and delicate to different sort of ways that you might, um, you know, a sentence with different intonations can mean very different things. Okay. And like part of the director's job is like, uh, yeah, is the meaning that we're trying to like get across actually being get, gotten across. So it's like, I might have to be like super, I might have to be super rigid about like, Okay, I actually need you to say this line this way every night in order for a certain meaning to emerge. If you say it differently, it might give the impression that the play is actually about the, or the scene is actually about this other thing, which that it's not about. Um, so there's sort of like macro and micro mm -hmm. yeah. levels of okay. like, yeah, exactitude okay. versus like. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question about, we talked about earlier, like, the idea of, this is way at the beginning, the idea of using robotics in terms of like doing jobs that humans, like it's not safe for humans, things like that. And then also the idea of like comfortability in robotics that have human-like qualities. Um, I grew up a dancer, but ballet specifically. Oh. So that one always felt like a little robotic in <laughs> classes. <Yeah. laughs> and I was just thinking like, is there, are there things that you think we'll never get to humanity-wise in robotics? Humanity-wise or? Or human-likeness. 
I guess. Um, I actually, I actually hope they do not become a team, only because for a selfish reason, which is that it makes us as humans less special. I feel like. I mean, I I support the use of technology and robots for humans to make new art and enhance their art. Robots that that can assist with painting or, um, you know, a special prosthetic uh, uh, drumming hand that can drum faster, that enables an individual with limb loss to drum faster than humanly possible, or robots that are dance partners. But robots replacing humans, I feel, yeah. Where do you draw my, that line? That ex existential threat, uh, I, that's my immediate, immediate reaction um and i based on what i've seen so far i just i don't think that this idea of the singularity there are some people that believe it's right around the corner maybe it is but from what i've seen so far we're so far away we are hand tuning billions of parameters and having no idea of why and it's based on like a single reward function to do one very specific thing that doesn't generalize to a different robot, a different task, different scenario. So this this idea of chasing general artificial intelligence is still for us. There are people working on it. Um, I'm I'm more focused on how to use our current tools to improve quality of life. Do you know why people are so focused on it? Like I've never quite understood the draw of like trying to make machines like us. Maybe because it's I don't know. Maybe there's a Feeling like a god is one thing that comes to mind. Yeah. Maybe it's just the the, temp, the temptation or the excitement of doing something that no one's ever done before. The exploratory nature. Hard for me to put myself in their shoes. So <laughs> I'm sure there are better reasons. We need to get one of those uh, believers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you talked about earlier how like humans tend to always put people or things in a category like gender or like, other things. And if robots are just what humans make, then how do we make robots unbiased and like make choices that aren't catered to how the program is made? Them? That's a great question that I don't think anyone has an answer to yet. <laughs> Only because robots are still programmed by humans who inherently have their own biases. I think what you can do to try and combat that, like risk mitigation, is have more voices and perspectives in the room on the design teams and coding things and testing. Like, why didn't you test that with darker skinned individuals? That would have revealed that this this program fails for that um, segment of the population. And that should be of interest to people who, who also only care about the economics and possibility because that's you know for example half, half the world is female and, and um, you know original designs for airbags were, were intended for men not children not women or when men have smaller bodies i i think this touches a little bit on that question so i wanted to probe this a little more because i think the inherent you know the inherent issue with biases based on the designer are always going to be present based on the fact that any of these designs are human centric. Mm -hmm. So could we be inspired by sort of an artistic rendering of robotic performance, whether that's for example movement, um, that is not to serve a uh, functionality for the human body, but is simply you know um, designed to be beautiful for the human or something else, but not so tethered to functionality, right? And mm -hmm. could that teach us this is why I was sort of hoping to say well could can robots teach us how to Embody different genders, for example, mm -hmm. among other things, right? But this is maybe a broader question to that. And maybe performance art or art itself and the embodiment of art can teach us something about how to sort of entirely bypass the implicit biases that humans in their own sort of narrow lived experiences will impose, right? So maybe the question is. And you have to make a performance with robots. With what would robots. you do? <laughs> what would they do? <laughs> with only with robots. With yeah. humans in there. I think okay. like an only robot ballet would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I mean, uh, yeah, both. Um, 
I, get, I feel sort of stuck on this question of like, could a robot move in a way that like really feels totally novel or totally um, unfamiliar? I guess, I mean, A, on this sort of like programming level, like would we know how to program that? But even if it could move, then I'm also thinking about, again, like our perceptual apparatus. Like, could I even, if it was moving in some way, like, could I even perceive that? Um, yeah, or like it, how is, um, yeah, I guess like how are the capabilities of the robot? Like, how are those parameters like defined by what we understand as like being the possibilities of the world? Um, yeah, but well, okay, what would I do with a robot performance? <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think like extreme like precision is something that we, can't totally do. I mean, one of the a really amazing performance that I saw once was these two Australian dudes who it was like half an hour straight of the most incredibly unison, precise movement, like synchronized that I've ever seen. And just like the amount of effort that it takes for humans to achieve that like level. Um, whereas like a machine can you know, you could have 60, mm -hmm. a sort of like robot chorus of like 60 mm -hmm. executing like really, really precise. So I don't know, I guess like maybe I would think about some kind of like really sort of intricate, some sort of incredibly intricate mm -hmm. dance um, with like, you know, really like sharp timing or something that maybe would be like push, at least pushing, if not past mm -hmm. the bounds of like of human um, capacity. Yeah, that's yeah. my first thought. But. I think, yeah, those are those are the advantages, like the precision that you mentioned, the scalability, having a thousand of these. I mean, I think there was a Super Bowl um, halftime show that had like a thousand drones or whatever, and you see big clouds of, of different animations in the sky. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's funny to think about art with such precision. Because normally I naturally think of art as being very free flowing, and one is one instance is not exactly the same as the next, which is kind of what makes it beautiful to me. But um, you know, being able to do things that are superhuman, spinning joints around 360 degrees that humans can't do, or moving, um, having specific movements or speed of movements, that is flying, and mm -hmm. these are things that humans. Can't cannot do without technology. Something that I that I heard from a, an artist friend of mine was that like good art is you know the right amount of talent with a little bit of sloppiness, control mm -hmm. sloppiness. Okay. Maybe that's something you could program into a robot, mm -hmm. just a little bit of sloppiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Kind of on the topic of like robots potentially being used in or creating art. Like when we were talking about your experience with directing and stuff, you were telling us how like there were a lot of decisions you had to make in terms of like how people should say certain lines, how everything comes together to like make an art piece, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and then when you were talking about how you were telling your students like the robot only did what you programmed it to do. I was wondering if you guys had opinions on like whether you think robots could create their own art mm -hmm. basically, or is that like something uniquely human because it all comes from human people yeah. wow um i mean like my response is like not yet i guess <laughs> i guess or it seems like hard to to imagine and i think that like yeah that sort of element of like there's something about that element of perfection or of like exactitude that like yeah to your point of like uh, it's like we did just like a little sloppiness or like something to go like a little bit wrong um yeah, I don't know. It's like it's like I don't know. I, I mean, there's all the like AI art that's like going around now, right? It's like Dolly and there's like whatever, and it's like no, it's almost like a, it's like a little like you're just like yes, like does this sort of like tick the boxes of like what is art? Like sure, <laughs> like does it have a soul? Does it seem like it expresses somebody's like life force? Whatever that means. <laughs> like I don't know. Um, yeah, but I don't know how you like how you measure that or like could that be something that you sort of like approximate through mm -hmm. a formula? I think mean, that's interesting the way you put it with the checkboxes because that's kind of how I feel a 
about robot painting, for example. Mm -hmm. It's a camera looking at an image, thresholding it according to some algorithm that someone wrote, figuring out, okay, where, where do I draw a line or do I, my, I comprise this of dots. Then the robot, the actuation system will actually place paint or whatever the medium is. And it's a recreation and you can program it with different styles, but it still feels like it's lacking the soul or like the interpretation mm -hmm. from a human. Uh, I don't know, it's hard to say because a human did write the algorithm, <laughs> but they programmed it and maybe they did program it with their own style, not to mimic pointillism or whatever it is. But, it, you know, I, I think I just saw an article where I think students, I think it's Virgin Tech, programs a robot to do graffiti <laughs> and basically type in the letters and it will paint in the style of graffiti. But again, that's I feel like you're recreating something when machine did it. I guess <laughs> that's, that's still what I'm hung up a little bit on. I, I, I'm impressed by it. But would I personally have gotten more satisfaction if I had done it with my own hand? Yeah. I did. So I did participate in a, this is, this is kind of, I mean, you probably know this well, in LA there's all these sort of AI art shows now. And I did participate in a couple of them because I had some friends presenting. And they were, I think, posing some really interesting questions. Uh, you know, it wasn't clear which pieces, so they were all originals, some of them by AI, some of them by humans, uh, but, you know, minimally supervised AI, basically. And it was a collective of humans who were supervising minimally anyway. So authorship was truly hmm. just, Queer, so to speak, right? Uh, and it was interesting to see this exhibit where it wasn't clear who did what and what was human and what wasn't human. And you know that sort of forced me to sit with like what I was watching. And I don't know for whatever it's worth. One, I thought with the art, you know, it has to be consumed after all, regardless of who produces it. I think once the piece is done, it transcends the author itself, and it just embodies any meaning that that media as a server provides it. So in a way it kind of trivialized and, and made the authorship perhaps less important than I usually have thought uh, it was. Um, and the second thing that I did was really pose that interesting question, like what happens when authorship is unknown or just really uh, blurred? And maybe you can name names, but not entirely clear what the context was, what the, you know, if you go to traditional museums, uh, oftentimes we're told, you know, very linearly, you know, this is the epoch, and this is the run. And you tell this really linear story, and I feel like maybe these types of exhibits help us not completely disrupt that, but realize that we are consuming what we call art in very, you know, prescribed ways as well. With what at that exhibit, I realized perhaps too much of an obsession over authorship mm -hmm. and who is the author and why are they trying to tell the story. That's interesting. Yeah. That makes me think too, though, about your example about um, the robot with citizenship versus like the people who can't drive. It's like there's also like there's collective. There's artists collectives. There are humans who are playing with that, who are who are like making work that's trying to sort of complicate that notion of like the auteur or the individual author. So it's like, do we need to go to the robot art, or can we think about like other sorts of like human structures that are that are playing with a de-hierarchical um, or like decentered model. Your comment about authorship makes me think more about like, why do I feel the way that I feel about this issue? And maybe it's less about authorship because of the reason that you said, and maybe it's about my own hang up and perception of effort. Put in. Mm -hmm. I feel like there's just, you know, the craftsmanship to making things with your hands or actually writing a book or, or painting something or carving something that takes a certain amount of time and it, when it gets turned into a half second photo and then you press go and you walk away and then you come back and it's there because someone else did it for you. It, I just, I feel like maybe it's the level of, of human effort that went into it. Um, but I guess I, I, on the flip side, I should think, well, maybe, maybe it took two years for someone to program the robot and build it. And that was the effort invested. I don't 
Yeah. There's, there's no answer. I'm just telling you about the different ways I feel about this. Yeah. <laughs> conflicting. I have conflicting people. Um, yes, please. Sorry. So we go on a little bit over. Is that okay? Yes. Um, I guess the role models have to be healthy like we use in a lot of ways. And I was just wondering like um what kind of what are some of the like matrix to determine and consider whether these robots or artificial intelligence are successful because you know like a warehouse is probably determined by when it picks up the item correctly or stuff like that. But as for now, like um there are also other ethical stuff to be in consideration, such as you know, in college when students use chat GPT to write their essay, you know, how how do you know if like how is that wrong, ethically wrong or not? Because technically we are just using a tool to kind of help us, you know, in a way just like robot helping the warehouse taking over their job. Yeah. So, you know, like what are kind of some of the considerations of you brought up chat GBT, which I think ties in nicely to what we've been talking about. And it goes back to authorship and where the ideas come from. And there was a recent article, I think um, Vanderbilt University had to issue a mea culpa for crafting a statement to their student body about the Michigan State um, shootings. And at the bottom, it said this was partially created by chat GPT. No. Right? And so think about that. Why does everyone have this reaction? Because what if everything in that statement were true and valid and conveyed what the administrators meant to convey? But there's something like not human and not emotional and not empathetic about delegating it to something non-human. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's why my guttural instinct was real. Really? <laughs> who who thought of that? Yeah. You can just down and write your own thing for five minutes that was that came from your own heart and brain. So I I know you were asking about usefulness, but when you said chat GPT and we were talking about authorship and that and effort that just struck a chord. Um, as far as usefulness, I think it depends on the application and the metric. If the application is something like manufacturing, then of course Amazon cares about moving pallets of goods as fast as possible and picking the right things and not having to deal with um, you know, customers complaining about incorrect orders. Um, if you're talking about e-mining, now it's in terms of lives saved. I guess it, it depends on the application. Okay. Maybe one last quick question. We'll wrap up. Okay, I was just thinking like about the authorship thing because I think like, you know, like sometimes statements like that are like really hard to write and like you don't want your own biases to like come across and in like with what you're saying. And even though like ChatGPT and other robots are coded by humans, like depending on like how many people were in the room, like maybe sometimes it can be more objective. So like, is it, is it just about like it is human writing it makes it better or like should we consider like other scenarios where like a thing that was created by like more than one individual is maybe like a better option? I don't know. <laughs> um, I again I feel like maybe I don't know enough about chat GPT, but but um it Still, I feel like it's driven by the data that it was provided, what, it, what was the algorithm seeded with, and by whom, and for what purpose. And without some level of empathetic oversight or, you know, thing, I don't think, I don't think empathy is something that we have taught to algorithms yet. So that's, that's something that I think really keeps us apart from other, just, you know, artificial entities. And I think that's one of the most valuable things about being human. Yeah, agreed. And it makes me think about like relationships too. Like 
okay, so what if then, you know, to avoid bias, it's like, what if a group of like five administrators had come together and had worked on that statement together? And in doing that, they would have worked through their own feelings. They would have had conversations with each other. They would have been like forging some kind of relationship to, you know, the student body, to the university. And by like feeding it to the machine, it's like you're cutting off all of the opportunities to build those human relationships. It's like, okay, I'm not gonna have a relationship with, I'm not gonna talk to my colleagues about this. I'm not building a relationship with the students. It's just like the machine becomes this sort of like mediator um, that kind of like short circuits, I guess I'll say like those, the possibilities for that relationality, which like, yeah, is being alive. <laughs> I kind of, you know, I have a bit of a distinct opinion with respect to both of these. I wanted to be a bit provocative. Oh, yeah. Great. Because I also see on the flip side, and I mean, this is, I'm not just being provocative for the sake of being, and on the flip side, oftentimes we receive messages from, you know, offices, say the chancellor's office, um, <laughs> or any other sort of, a, you know, higher power where you know it's a, you know, it's a peer move of some sort, yeah. where they're drafting not to convey, trying to convey sympathy and compassion. Again, questions of who's seen and who's unseen, right? And when they're thinking about who they want to appeal to, who they want to appease, mm -hmm. they are crafting and optimizing for that as well. And you write one letter or one statement, it might take you a long time, but once you do that 20 times, you are also trained to write really quickly. Mm -hmm. Veronica, you and I write proposals really, really quickly these days, right? You know how to do that. And so we kind of train to optimize for that. And so, Oftentimes, those statements can backfire because they come out as this genesis. Or if you're part of a minoritized group and don't feel represented, it will backfire. And so I think that just to flip this to the other side, I think things like GPT can teach us the nuances of how packaging messages, however you took shortcuts or not, can be biased to appeal to certain communities and not others. And, how you truly can shortcut empathy, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. whether you're human or not. <laughs> What's funny is what you described and, and the way that you you could look at a lot of the statements as being very strategic and PR related. It's almost like you would want to put this was partially written by chat. You, you just you have an out. <laughs> yeah, right. <yeah. laughs> like template form. Well, it's because of you. <laughs> Well, no, no. yeah, so I really wanted to be respectful of everybody's time. So I wanted to thank our panelists and, of course, all of you.